Again, I ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse 18 in just a moment, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. But as we have announced for some time in this series of lessons, we hope that each lesson is able to stand on its own in the message presented in it. And yet they are designed one to follow the other and build thereupon this lesson building on those that have gone before because we're interested in not only getting just the message but understanding something about rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. For such is necessary if we're to study as we ought to study and as we must study to get out of the Bible and only what God put into the words of the Bible that we might know the will of God. Now I want you to notice as we read, again, 2 Corinthians 5. All things and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now as found in the preceding sermon, the apostles began their work as ambassadors for Christ, in the great city of Jerusalem on that first Pentecost day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> now, it was, to say the least, an auspicious time to begin their particular work. And you may remember that I said some time back that we would give more attention to the work of the ambassadors of Christ. We emphasize again that the apostles of Jesus Christ are the ambassadors of Christ from the court of heaven where Christ reigns to man on earth. Let's remind ourselves too that an ambassador from the government of the United States, let's say, to any other government in the world is the official representative of this government to any other world government. And it's through that ambassador that the United States government presents its official position on anything. He has certain credentials. That is, that he is authorized to fulfill that position. That would be true of any other ambassador from any other government to the United States government. Now remember, the church of our Lord is the kingdom of Christ. Christ's word is law because he is the sovereign king sitting at the right hand of God and ruling over his kingdom. Now he would complete the revelation of God to man through his ambassadors on earth. If you read John chapters 14, 15, and 16, you'll see the Lord had not fulfilled all that he intended to do in his teaching and also, being mere mortals, they had to have a way to infallibly remember everything he taught them. And he told them that the Holy Spirit would come to them and work with them invisibly, as he had worked with them physically, and thus would guide them into all truth and cause them to infallibly remember everything he had taught them. Thus, they would be able to speak in his stead. That's why the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's because they knew that Jesus, their Savior and their King, was speaking through them by the Holy Spirit so that when they infallibly spoke for Christ, that was the will of Christ. We need to understand that, and many people don't as they study the Bible, as to how we got the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, at this time... On the day of Pentecost, as Luke records in Acts 2, the Jews were scattered among all the nations of the earth and had been for quite some time since the Babylonian captivity. Remember, all Jews didn't return to restore Jerusalem and Judea. 
but many of them continued to remain all over the world. They had been in this dispersed condition long enough to acquire the language of the people wherever they were scattered. Notwithstanding, they had become citizens of various nations. They, in great numbers, according to the law, because they were devout Jews, attended the annual feast at Jerusalem. In order to understand fully, completely, the work of the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, or the apostles of Christ, and we would remind you the word apostle means one chosen and sent out on a specific mention, it's necessary that we keep before our minds the order of events. It all has to do with the part of how to study the Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth. Acts chapter 1 closes with an account of the selection of one to take the place of Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Christ, to take the place of him in the apostleship, and the words that Luke chose are this. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles, verse 26. As a secondary matter here, it's good to note that casting lots could be a matter of gambling, but casting lots did not have to be a matter of gambling. And they recognized here that God would designate between the two men they'd selected as to which one he wanted as to who the lot fell upon, and it fell upon Matthias. No gambling involved here, no wagering involved here. Well, it doesn't mean that it couldn't have been else used somewhere else, even as people who are gamblers gamble over about anything. I don't think I've ever heard of this, but it may be that somebody might be gambling over how short a sermon I would preach would be long. If I knew about it, I'd try to work it to where it'd be as long as I wanted it. <laughs> In chapter 2, when you come to Acts 2, you find it beginning, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, now that's referring to the apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, we're all with one accord in one place. And we see, and suddenly, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And then it says, and there appeared, or they were, they were all filled, not appear, but they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, verses 1 through 4. Now, according to the scriptures, this was a fulfillment of the promise. Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Chapter 1 and verse 5. But then the narrative goes on. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Verses 5 and 6 of Acts 2. Now it was the apostles who were together in one place. They were the ones that were baptized in the Holy Ghost. The people were not where they were. Not all of them by any stretch of the imagination. They were scattered throughout the city of Jerusalem at that time. But now when they heard this remarkable occurrence, they came to where the apostles were. They were, as you know, Jews. In fact, we can say they were of that class of whom it was said later by Paul, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Acts 13 and verse 46. They were devout men. Now it's interesting to note that that's the same term that's used to describe the first Gentile convert who was a devout man. But I learned that a devout man is not necessarily a saved man. In Antioch, Acts chapter 13 and verse 50, you'll see that the Jews, after the gospel had been preached, stirred up the devout women raised a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and cast them out of the city. Then at Athens 17 and verse 17 of Acts, 
The Apostle Paul disputed with the devout persons. These devout women, these devout persons were not saved people. It does tell us their dedication and their conviction to whatever it was they believed. The devout men that were dwelling at Jerusalem were simply Jews devoted to their religion. They were unsaved people in the sense of them being saved by the gospel of Christ. They didn't know anything about the gospel of Christ. They were approaching God under Judaism. That's all they knew. That had been God's law for the Jews for almost 1,500 long years. In effect, what you've got happening is that you're devoted to God under the law of Moses, but that's ending. Now there's a new system, the gospel system, and you must get out of that system and get in this system if you're going to remain acceptable to God. They were unsaved from the standpoint of being saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is God's power to save anybody, Romans 1 verse 16. And they uh, all there assembled. And when Peter preached to them, among other things, he came down and actually charged them with having crucified Jesus with wicked hands, Acts 2 and verse 23. And because of their state, he then exhorts them, save yourselves from this untoward or this crooked generation, verse 40. Well, through curiosity, they were led then to where the apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven were. Their first impressions were wholly erroneous. You remember that, don't you? For they thought the apostles were drunk. You don't pay a lot of attention to a drunk man as far as learning much from him. Except you learned he was drunk. Peter began his discourse, and this is an important point in teaching anybody, folks, by removing the false impressions that was in the minds of the hearers. Let me emphasize this to my brethren in preaching the gospel. This is always necessary. It seems that some brethren in going out to preach the gospel don't realize that you have to dispel false notions before you can sow the seed of the kingdom. It's no small part of a preacher's work to get erroneous ideas out of the minds of the people. And from experience and to me common sense of the teaching of the Bible, all three together, it frequently requires more time to clear away the briars and the thorns and all kinds of weeds. Uh, if you're going to build a brand new building right where this one is, you have to tear this one down first. That's just common sense. And it takes more time sometimes to do that than it is to plant the seed in the soil because it takes a lot to prepare the soil. And we need to understand that in the proclamation defense of the gospel. You just can't put a new building where this one is and not tear this one down first. As long as these people thought the apostles, in this case, to be drunk, they weren't going to give heed to what they had to say, which was the word of God that saved their soul. In other words, there was no place to sow the seed of the kingdom if people didn't pay attention to it. We should understand that too as members of the church and going out to preach the gospel to every creature. We are seed sowers, and all the time the seed may fall, it may not be on good ground. It's a possibility the ground can change, can it? The seed's still there, it may germinate. Peter shows how they could not be drunk, if you read Acts 2. But on the contrary, he points out that this was a fulfillment. What all these things that were happening was fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy which concerned the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we learn from those Old Testament prophecies, all that was to take place in what's called the last days in the city of Jerusalem. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 32, is the passage that Peter uses to describe what's happening right here. And I may suggest that really these events ought to be seen in the light of Joel's prophecy. That's what the Holy Spirit had Peter say was happening and gave the people light on that day as to what was transpiring. And so it does the same thing for us. And then after earnestly inviting their attention to the words that he was about to speak, he told the wonderful story of Jesus Christ. He tells us about how God approved him by miracles, signs, and wonders. He tells how he was rejected by the people and how with wicked hands they crucified and slain the Son of God. 
But he says it was all in the divine working of things to save men from their sins. And God didn't leave him dead, but that he raised him from the dead. Pointing out how all the prophecies of the Christ in the Old Testament had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he closed his address with these words. Therefore, meaning the light of the material I present in the reasoning I've done. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, know if ands or buts about it. That all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Acts 2 verse 36. Now these folks came there not having any idea they were going to hear anything like this. They came there keeping the law and were devoted to it in their approach to God. But when all of this uh, was rumored around and noise around of the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but no wind, men who were unlettered people in formal education, able to speak languages they'd never studied as if it were that they came from the places they were speaking, all of that got their attention. Then it was dispelled in their minds as to what the situation was with the apostles, to what it actually was. And that it was all coming from God and fulfillment of prophecy. And then the marvelous story of Jesus Christ and the gospel preached. Now when they, that is the people who heard and understood, were pricked in their heart. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37. So now the people come together. They were in doubt for a while. Because you remember they said to one another, what means this? They knew it meant something. They didn't know what it meant. But now they've heard the truth. Now they've been persuaded by the evidence and the word of God. And they've been led to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, their Messiah. For you know faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. The earnestness with which they ask, what shall we do? is proof of what I've just said about them. Now, had they not believed what they had heard, they wouldn't have been infected by it the way they were. Neither would they have sought guidance from the apostles. And in going out to teach people the gospel, you can tell whether they're receiving it as they ought to by their response. The question, what shall we do? clearly shows that they believed there was something that they must do. They just didn't know what it was. And that they had the ability to do what was required of them. The fact that the apostle, and remember the apostles are guided by the Holy Spirit, told them what to do, shows that there was something for them to do and that they could do what was required. But you're not told that. Among the denominations today, you're told the very opposite. There's nothing for you to do to be saved by Christ. And if you attempt to do anything, you're trying to earn your salvation. Well, they didn't know that here. And here the people who heard the gospel first preached in its fullness, were convicted of their sins, knew they were separated from God. When they came there thinking they were fully acceptable to God, they knew that they needed to do something. So many brethren, what shall we do? Well, being now believers, verse 38 gives the answer. They were believers, believers only, believers based upon the evidence in the preached sermon. And that they knew this was from God because miracles were work that no mortal could do. And thus they paid attention to the message that was preached. And answer two, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit approved was then given to their question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now what was their attitude toward that answer? Well, the scripture says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received the word. You know, it doesn't say a thing about those that didn't gladly receive it. It says those that were glad to hear the answer to the question. They received the word. They gladly received the word. They understood the word. And it says they were baptized. 
And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Again, verse 41. Now these were saved from their sins. That is, they were reconciled to God. Upon what condition? Well, they had heard the gospel of Christ. The Bible says the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. They had understood it. They had received it. They became believers in obedience to the command of God. In this case, through the apostle Peter. They had repented of their sins and they were baptized. I remind you again that repentance is the breaking down of that old stubborn will which is the seed of all sin and rebellion against God. And it says, now whatever God requires of us, we'll do it. And wasn't that their question? Men and brethren, shall, what shall we do? They were told to repent. That's something they do. Now, what did it mean for them to repent? To resolve that they would remove themselves from all and everything that they were doing that was wrong. And they'd live the rest of their life that way. They were going to do it in about face. Based upon their attitude of the heart that had been changed. And thus they received the truth concerning remission of sins. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. In the word of reconciliation committed to the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth as shown uh, earlier and I think it was the third sermon of this series there was you remember preaching there was hearing there was faith there was penance, repentance and there was baptism now look here where the gospel is first preached in its fullness in this the first case of reconciliation. After the ambassadors of the court of heaven entered into their work, what do you have? There was preaching. There was hearing. There was faith. There was penance. And there was baptism. And even the reason for baptism was given for the remission of sins. As this was the beginning of the preaching of repentance and remission of sins, in the name of or by the authority of Christ, the Savior of mankind, the inspired historian Luke has given this case. Now listen, this case more in detail than any subsequent cases of reconciliation. Point concerning reconciling men to God. Concerning the right division of the word to understand how many are reconciled to God. This is the day the church started and you have this full detailed presentation of the gospel. Now listen. Any other time in the book of Acts where the gospel is preached. Even though you may not have as full of a detailed discussion of those cases of conversion. They're all seen in the light of this one. Every one of them. They don't change. They're seen in the light of this full one, the very first one, which lays the basis for understanding all the rest. So when you go through the rest of them, because it doesn't mention in detail, every one of those conversions like it does here, then do you think it changed? No, here's the basis to compare all the rest of them. Every one of them. And that's a point concerning rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, one other point. Take a little longer than usual. So if you bet on me quitting early, you lost. <laughs> the next point I want to make is the extraordinary work of the ambassadors of the court of heaven. I say extraordinary, not ordinary. You know, there was intense excitement immediately following the events that we discovered, discussed, discussed. And you see that instead of these folks who were devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven returning to their, their homes, as was the custom of the visiting Jews, you got a bunch of new converts, new members of the church. These are reconciled to God by the word of reconciliation. They heard, preached, believed, and obeyed. And they remained there in the city of Jerusalem. Joyously they engaged, as you can read in your scriptures and see, and all the acts of service of this new institution, the Lord's Church. They had loving fellowship one with another, their brethren in the Lord. 
they had all things common, and that just simply means they had such a disposition of mind that if anybody lacked anything, they were glad to help them out with what they had in the distribution of their goods. And that should characterize Christians always. That's what's meant, by the way, by being ready unto every good work. You can see it exemplified there in the new converts. It didn't take them 40 years to understand that. Yes, I know they had the teaching of the law of Moses concerning godly conduct and attitude toward people, but nevertheless... They had this, and that was characteristic of the early church, the attitude one toward another and to help one another. They continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat or food with gladness and singleness of heart. They were united, you see. All believed and practiced the same thing. And in doing so, they praised God, and they had favor with all the people. Acts 2, verse 46 and 47. If you ever wanted to see good people as God defines good people, here they are. And you can't get any better than the ones God calls good. They were amazed at the many wonders and signs which are done by the apostles, done to confirm the word. Now, it was mentioned here lately how that miracles weren't just done to work miracles. Brother Jeff did a good job on that. If you want to see a further emphasis given to that, because people get so beside themselves over miracles, and I admit to see a man dead and raised from the dead by the words of another man, that would make anybody sit up and take notice, and that's exactly what they were supposed to do. In other words, the supernatural, God was involved in this because these fellows did things no mortal could do. Well, was, was the concentration then to be on the miracle, or was it to be on the word spoken by the man who worked the miracle? Listen to this. In Acts 13, the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, or on Cyprus. And we have the account of where they were sent for by Sergius Paul, a prudent man, who wanted to hear the gospel preached. And of course they had one there who was a wicked man, a fellow by the name of Elymas, who by interpretation is Bar Jesus, who tried to come between Sergius Paulus and Paul and Barnabas as they came to preach the word, and he invited them there. That is, Sergius Paulus did, to hear what they had to say. Well, Paul took care of the matter, and he worked a pretty good miracle, one that a lot of people don't like to think, because verse 10 of Acts 13, when, um, well, look at verse 9, when this man tried to turn the deputy away from the message they were preaching, the Scripture says that uh, Saul, who also is called Paul, that's the first time he's called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And said, O full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord's upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now, would you say that would be pretty much a Something to see, to get your attention. Notice the impact it had upon the deputy and see what it caused him to do. And he witnessed all of this. Verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, watch it, believed, being astonished at the miracle? No, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Doesn't mention a thing that he was astonished at the miracle, he was astonished at the message, at the teaching of the Lord regarding the plan of salvation, etc. Now, since it says he believed, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, obviously then he took the word preached by these men and said, since God is working with them by miracle, then what they have said is also from God as what they did. And he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, that's exactly what happened there on the day of Pentecost. That's what's happening for all through this time period that we just noticed concerning the apostles right after the church was established, doing all their work. And you'll remember, and we're going to close here in just a second, that during this time that they were beholding the miracles done by the apostles to confirm the word they preached, that it was from heaven and not from men. But Peter and John... Two of the apostles, two of the ambassadors of Christ were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. And that would be in our time period, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
and they come by a beggar. And he's asking alms. That's what he did all the time. This beggar had been lame from his mother's womb. He was born lame. And he was over 40 years of age. In other words, he's well known by the people. Everybody could recall him that walked through there. To him, Peter said this, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, who did he say that to, Acts 3, 6? A man who had never walked, born lame. And watch it, immediately. As soon as the words were said, his ankle bones, you know, looks a position, so he gets rather specific as to what this particular problem was. It wasn't just in his legs, it was actual bones of his ankles. Received strength, and he began to leap and praise God in the temple. And all the people saw this. Well, again, even if it was a Sergius Paulus, the wonderful miracle attracted the attention of the people and it afforded Peter an opportunity, once again, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people. And this discourse is the second one that God saw fit to put on record after the ambassadors of Christ, the apostles of Christ, began their work. And as a result of this discourse, here's what the scripture says. I bet many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of men were about 5,000. Acts 4 and verse 4. Well, where were the women? Well, it was Jewish custom to mention the men. So if you had 5,000 men, imagine the total that listened and believed and obeyed the truth. And in this history is brought out an important fact that must be observed in order to understand the work of these ambassadors of Christ. And that is, in their ministry, there were the ordinary and there was the extraordinary. The ordinary was simply the preaching of the message, the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the word by them and its reception and their obedience that is, the people who heard and understood their obedience to the gospel. But there was the extraordinary, and that would be then the miraculous manifestations that frequently attended their work. Back on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That just simply means the power came from God, and it was miraculous. It was powerful. At Solomon's portico, the lame man, to us where this took place, was healed. Going on through in Samaria, unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed, Acts 8, 7. An angel came to Philip the preacher and sent him in the way to meet the Ethiopian nobleman, Acts 8 and verse 26. And you'll remember in the case of Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. He saw a great light above the brightness of the noonday sun, Acts 9, 13. The Lord spoke to him directly. Then there was at Lydda, Aeneas, who was cured of the palsy, Acts 9, 34, by miracle. miracle. At Joppa, there was Dorcas, of whom the little folks sing about, a seamstress, if you please. She was raised from the dead, Acts 9, 40. At Caesarea, an angel appeared unto Cornelius, Acts 10 and verse 3. Four days later, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, verse 44. While at Philippi, there was a great earthquake that unsettled the foundations of the prison and loosed the bands of the prisoners, Acts 16, 26. Not being able to discriminate between these and the things which were ordinary, keeps many persons confused upon the subject of conversion. And they don't think there is a conversion unless there's a convulsion. With many, the idea seems to be that they must see a light or they must hear a voice or they must meet something remarkable before they can have assurance of their forgiveness of sins or salvation. And that gets entrenched in the minds of people and it isn't a lot of folks today. You know, 
there was a reason for miracles. And it was an important reason. We've already stated it. In Jesus' life, it proved he was the Son of God, or one of the proofs. In the case of the apostles, it proves they were ambassadors. Court of heaven, they were speaking the will of Christ. The word they spake came from God, not from men, because of the miracles, signs, and wonders they did. We need to understand that. But now listen, that's all over and done with. Because the word's fully revealed and confirmed by the miracle signs and wonders to be the word of God, not the word of man. And once it's confirmed, it's confirmed. Something confirmed doesn't have to be confirmed every day. If it's once confirmed, it's confirmed. Somebody says, well, I would believe it if I could just see it today. That was 2,000 years ago. What's time got to do with it? What's time got to do with it? That's like somebody being tried for murder 40 years ago, and they found him innocent. Well, that's 40 years ago. Don't we need to try it again? A thing once confirmed is confirmed. The Word of God was confirmed. It's still the Word of God. And that's why you have the Bible. And that's why you have these accounts. Yeah, but I, don't, I didn't see it. I didn't see a lot of things. I didn't see anything to do with World War II, so it didn't happen. That doesn't make sense. We don't use that in any other thing when it comes to religion. I've been dealing with a guy that was one of my high school class. Hadn't been around him until about a year or so ago. And that's only on Facebook. He just is, um, I don't know how to say it, just as worldly as a person can be. It's a nice way to put it. And he won't accept anything in the Bible. Unless you can show me sources outside the Bible that says this and thus and so. Well, I can. I can. But he won't recognize that the whole Bible is composed of books of antiquity that no person that's learned and scholarly in those things will deny that they are not books of antiquity written thousands of years ago. Now, once I establish that, beloved, once I establish that, what I read to you this morning from the Bible is either the truth of what happened 2,000 years ago or it's a lie. Now, what have I got to do to show that what I read to you this morning is a lie? How would you go about it? Think about it. I'm going to prove that what we read of in Acts 2 is a lie and it never happened. It's a fabrication. How would you do it? If you can do that, then there's so many other things you would apply the same approach to and prove that Caesar's commentaries on the Gallic Wars just didn't happen. They just were manufactured by Caesar. And so you would deal with all books of antiquity the same way, on the same grounds, and you won't know what happened. You won't know what transpired in years gone by. So I'm saying you can even approach the Bible just as a historian must approach things from the past, and you can show that it bears all the evidence that it happened and is true. In fact, we have so much more uh, material coming down to us to prove the Bible to be what it claims to be than we do on about any work of ancient literature that nobody questions. And that is just the fact of it. Now, that the converting power was not in the miracles is evident from this fact. The miracles were wrought upon one thing or class while the conversions were from another class. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. It was the multitude who glad to receive the word and were baptized. At Solomon's porch, the lame man was the subject of the miraculous power. Those who heard the word preached on that occasion were brought to belief in Christ the Son of God. Aeneas was cured of a palsy while all that dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now how did they turn to the Lord without the gospel of Christ? How did they turn to the Lord from whatever it was they were in without knowledge of the doctrine of Christ? Dorcas was raised to life and it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Is that a fabrication and a lie or a statement of fact 2,000 years old? I tell you now it's a statement of fact, for there is nothing to speak to the contrary at all that is successful in showing it is a lie. So for what purpose were the miracles performed? Those that Jesus performed testified to the divine character, but I'm going to get into that later. So keep that in mind. 
If that whets your appetite, then let it whet. <laughs> but today, I think we presented, if you've been with us through all of this, we presented certainly enough to convince an honest-hearted person that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, that there's a proper way to rightly divide the word of truth so that you can know the will of Jesus Christ and understand that you need to obey Him. Now, are you ready to ask the question? Because it's already been answered, men and brethren, what shall we do? If you are... I simply cause you to reflect back on the message from the divine volume. It was proven to be from God, not from man, by miracle signs and wonders almost 2,000 years ago. And that proof still stands. That's the Word of God. If you need to obey the gospel, you know what the Bible requires of you. And we ask you to humble yourself, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. Now, as a child of God, have you continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine? If not, and you fail, then repent of those things. Turn back and do what you once did but quit, praying God for forgiveness, having confessed your sins. But if you're subject, now is the time to act, for you have no other but now. Would you come to Jesus while we stand and while we sing?